as we pause and we reflect on your word, as we wait and sit under the weight of scripture, may you speak to us. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Your word never returns void. We need you now, whether we're online or in the room. Come, Holy Spirit. Less of me and more of you. And all God's people said, Amen. I'm going to try something different today. Now, online, I want you to join in as much as you can. I'm going to sing a song, and I want you to either join in or fill in the gaps as you see fit. Is that okay? Cool. Tanya's with me. You ready? Here we go. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Amazing. Don't do it, Tanya. Don't do it. Don't keep going. Tanya did the first service. She started singing the next part of that line. That was a song we used to sing all the time in kids' church. And I don't know, maybe it was a way to make us joyful in kids' church that we'd be woken up early and brought in to church. But it provokes a question today. Do you have joy in your heart? Is that song true for you? When I was young, it wasn't. So we added a second verse. And if the devil tries to take it, you can punch him in the face. What? Punch him in the face. What? And then mum's like, that's a bit violent. So we weren't allowed to sing that around kids' church so much. But we sung it quietly. And what's wrong with punching the devil in the face? It might nothing for all those mums out there. Oh, I've done it again. <sighs> Friends, if you are a teenager in the room and you're wondering, wow, this is, I'm starting to get bored right now. Can we leave? The answer is yes, you can. Our yeah, high schoolers are going to head on out. If you're online, hey, there's, uh, it's great to have you with us. Now, friends, the question is, do you have joy in your heart today? Do you have joy in your heart today? And how do we know, right? If we look around this beautiful paraphernalia that James and the team have set up, which I think looks amazing. I'm so thankful for our creative team. But we look at these words called joy. And my question is, is joy more than just a seasonal greeting? We're heading into Advent. And just so you know, Advent actually begins next week, not this week. But we love Christmas so much here at New Life. We're a week early. And we're okay with that in Jesus' name. So here we are in a season called Advent. And Advent is a season which is meant to say, ad, which is to, vent, come, to come. It's a season where we pause and we remember the time when people were waiting on the one who was to come. The Savior who wants to come. But not only that, I don't know if we know this, but sometimes we think Advent is all about the birth of Jesus. Did you know that for the majority of Christian history, Advent, this time of year, was not about the birth of Christ? That this time of year was actually not about His first coming, but was a time of preparation and waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we lose that in the marketing of this season. Maybe you're here today and going, and you're new to church, you're on the second coming of Jesus Christ. What's that all about, friends? If you don't know, then we have good news for you today. Because over 2 billion people around the world right now will celebrate Christmas this year. In fact, the UN had just counted that we are up to 8 billion people now in our world. So it's probably more like 3 billion people. It's the most universally recognized holiday all around the world. We pause to celebrate not just Christmas trees, not just stockings, but the birth of Christ. But sometimes it can get lost, can't it? Sometimes Christmas can get lost in the idea of it's all about family, it's all about food, it's all about gifts. And friends, I'm going to tell you as a Christian, I've got to be honest. We've got to come to reckon with the ideas. Is the reasons we celebrate Christmas strong enough? What do I mean by that? If the reason you celebrate Christmas can't be celebrated by everyone around the world, then your reason for celebration is too weak. If the only reason we celebrate Christmas is family, they're going to tell you there this Christmas there will be people without family. So it's not strong enough. If the only reason you celebrate Christmas is because of food, which, hey, that's a good reason, but there'll be people this year who won't have enough food. So it's not good enough. If it's gifts, there'll be people who go without gifts. If it's money, there'll be people who go with. The reason we celebrate Christmas must be stronger than merely the fruits of Christmas. And that's why we pause for Advent. To remind our souls in the midst of the marketing campaigns around us, there is a reason to pause and celebrate. Because at this time of year, we remember that we were given gifts. Eternal gifts that don't just happen in a seasonal moment, but are anchors for our souls. Gifts that are stronger than family, food, and friends. They are the gifts of love. The gifts of peace, the gifts of hope, and the gift of joy. Do you know love today? Do you know peace? Do you know hope and do you know joy? And so I want to pause for a moment and begin with that, that sense. Do we know joy? Do you know the joy 
that this season is meant to be characterized by. John Stott, a great Christian theologian, said this, one of the key markers of every Christian life should be joy. Do people look at your life and see joy? We sing about it, don't we? It's a great Christmas carol we heard about earlier. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Now, you might be sitting there going, but Michael, when I sing that song, it doesn't fill me with joy. Did you know there's actually a reason for this? They found out that Christmas carols can actually cause the opposite of joy and despair in people. In 2017, they did a psychological test. They found out that Christmas carols often lead to mental ill health because what Christmas carols remind people of is not joy and hope and peace, but all the things that they need to do before Aunt Ethel comes over on Christmas Day. So when you're wandering around the shops and you're feeling a little bit depressed because, you know, Deck the Halls is playing, the reason is is because you're thinking about prawns and how to get them this Christmas rather than focusing on what the season's meant to be about. It's meant to be about more. And we know this, friends. We talk about this every year. But I was just challenged as I was preparing for today. For the last two weeks, I've been praying about this. And I just really sense God say, is new life known for their joy? Are we a church known for our joy? What would it look like if we were? Because joy is not peripheral to the Christian story, friends. It's central. And we find this out in Luke chapter 2, when the angels come to a group of shepherds to tell them about the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, you will hear this story every year. And I was reading an article that said, we sometimes try and reinvent Christmas when actually all we need to do is sit in the same stories because they're beautiful in and of themselves. How, How good is that? That's so true. So come with me again into this story that many of us already know. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 11, we read, And in the same region that Jesus was born, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled. They were filled with great fear. And in the next moment, what did the angels say to them? The angels cry out and say, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news. Now, just Whenever the angels rock up, they always say, fear not, or don't be afraid. My opinion is, is every time you rock up somewhere, if you have to say, fear not, or don't be afraid, you should change your line of approach so you don't have to say that thing again. That would just be my advice to Gabriel. But moving on, funnier in the 8 a.m. I bring you good news of great joy, they say. That will be for all the people. For unto you this day, in the city of David, a Savior is born a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. I've come to bring you good news, they declare of great joy for all people. This is a bold statement, isn't it? The angels rock up, not knowing the shepherd's story, not knowing where they're at. And they just start to say, hey, we've got some joy for you. And and when I read this and I was praying about it, I'm like, man, that's a bit hard. It's a big claim. They're claiming that what they're about to talk about is joy for all people. And in my mind, I start to go to all the situations that aren't joyful right now. Does that mean that there is joy for those people who've got a bad diagnosis of cancer this year? Does that mean that the angels are saying there's joy for all people, even those facing financial hardship? Like, Are they that insensitive to think that they've got something that will solve that, that bring joy even in the hardest moments? For someone who's going through family breakups right now, that Christmas is a time of loneliness and hurt. Do the angels really have the boldness to say there is joy for you today? And the answer is, wherever you are, whatever suffering or pain you're walking through, the scandal of Christmas is this. Christmas's message is that there is joy for all. Do you know it today? Do you know it today? Why don't we know joy? Why is it so often a nice idea to talk about, but something that we don't actually know how to wrestle with or experience in our day-to-day lives? I'm going to talk about that today. I want to start with talking about the problem with happiness, the beauty of joy, and then finish by talking about the practice of joy. Let's start with the problem of happiness. One of the reasons why joy seems like a nebulous concept, I believe, is that because we confuse it with happiness. We think joy and happiness are the same thing. And like never before, we have an unprecedented focus on happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. So much so that the Americans enshrined it in their constitution. They said it was an unalienable right for everybody to be able to pursue happiness. Is that true? Do we all need to strive to be happy? 
McDonald's thought, though, thought, thought so. In 2003, they promoted Ronald McDonald to the CHO, Chief Happiness Officer of their corporation. Now we're like, no, that's a cute PR campaign. But other corporations thought, why don't we actually do that? And so they went and they employed a Chief Happiness Officer who was, whose role was to make and ensure the happiness of the staff. They were the person that ensured there was free beer at staff events, jet skis on staff retreats, and that everyone's emails were managed in a way that didn't stress them out. They found that what happened is that the happiness of the organization lifted, but the person who was the least happy in the organization was the chief happiness officer who had to deal with all the times that no one else was happy. Why? Because happiness is circumstantial. Happiness is this sense of something where our society says, you deserve to be happy. And if you're not, find someone else to blame. And the problem with that is, is it's not sustainable. Happiness is ultimately the desire we have to feel good. When we're happy, we're ultimately saying, I feel good right now. And when we're not happy, we solve it by pursuing things we think will make us happy. We know this story, right? We buy more things. We pursue more promotions. We do more things. We think these will make us happy. Why? The theologian says it's because our heart is like a massive vacuum that longs to suck onto anything that has the illusion of happiness around it. That's why we follow sport teams. Because we think if they can just, not the only reason, nothing wrong with sport, but sometimes we're like, if they win, I'll be happy. But only one team wins every year, leaving the majority of the population in despair. We, we pursue romantic relationships. Well, I can just get married. I'll be happy. We get married and we put all this weight on another person only find out they can't uphold it themselves. And then we're disappointed. We get promotions, more money, and there's this endless cycle of happiness. And actually comes this desire for happiness, which is rife in our day, comes from a guy named Epicurus. And Epicurus was an ancient philosopher who kind of gave birth to something called hedonism. And he, and he said the way to happiness is to, is to just really do four things. I said four things, but really that's meant to be four things. He said, number one, if you want to be happy, don't believe in God. Don't worry about death. Forget about pain and forget acquisition of meaningless things. Instead, chase sensual pleasure. His whole idea behind hedonism is this idea of just chase feeling good. Now, that sounds all right because there's nothing wrong with pleasure most of the time. But pleasure, in my experience, doesn't stack up against the abject reality of suffering and pain. I've never had pleasure that was stronger than some of the pain I've had to walk through in my life. And to deny that pain exists seems to be an emu's way of sticking its head into the ground and denying reality. Epicurious and, and hedonism seem to be detached, but so do so much of our society. In fact, psychologists today have said that this pursuit of happiness has, be, has started to become something known as the cult of happiness, that we all think it is our right to be happy. But there's news today I've come to tell you. Do you know that God never, ever promises that you will be happy? That is not God's motivation. And sometimes I think we assume that that is his end goal for us. And I don't believe it is. Happiness is not the end goal of the kingdom of God. Why? Because even the word happy came around in 1350 AD. It was a Middle English word that, that was derived from the meaning of someone who was known as lucky. To be happy was to be lucky. That's why happy also is a you know, root word for happenstance and happen. These are things that happen to us. They, they are circumstantial. They, they're coincidental. They're accidents. They're not generative, consistent events. And so if we chase happiness, friends, ultimately what we're chasing is like trying to hold water in your hand. It is a momentary experience, not a lifelong existence. You know, the psychologists have actually done studies in this and they found that 50% of your happiness is actually defined by your genetics, which means this. If you aren't happy right now, you can just blame mom and dad. Uh, but that makes sense to me. Like, I'm naturally quite a you know, melancholy kind of introverted person. And my wife is like, you know, she's just got so much happiness all the time. I'm like, where do you get this from? And I'm like, ah, oh. and I look at my parents. Not really. My parents are great. But that sense of like, so much of this is out of our control. And that's why what the angels come and say is so important. They don't come down and they don't say to the shepherds, we bring you news of great happiness. They say, we come to bring you news of joy. Because the beauty of joy is this, joy and happiness are not the same thing. Sometimes we use them as synonyms and they shouldn't be. Joy and happiness do not mean the same thing. Happiness is circumstantial. Happiness is accidental. Happiness is trying to hold water in your hand and realizing that you're left wanting every single time. Joy is something far more powerful than that. Friends, I believe that joy is an internal reality 
and an external trajectory. Let me say this again. I believe joy is an internal reality and an external trajectory. Because this is what the angels come and they say to the shepherds. Let's look at what they say again. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you, unto who? Not Mary, not Joseph, not the Pharisees. Unto you, they're talking to the shepherds. Is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. There's so much scandal in this. And we talk about this a lot of years whenever we talk about the shepherds. But it is scandalous that, they, that he says, unto you. To shepherds, why? Because shepherds, and many of you would know this, were the dropkicks of the Middle East. No one wanted to be a shepherd. In fact, this is why David, in the story of Jesse and David and his family back with Goliath, why David was out in the field, because he, he was the run to the litter. He was the one that no one wanted. And so they pushed him out to the field. Why? Because to be a shepherd was to be forgotten. To be a shepherd was to be no one. And there's something interesting that happens here. The angels rock up to the nobodies. The angels rock up to the outcasts. The guys that look like sheep. The guys that smell like sheep. The guys that probably, you know, it's probably are ah, ways a bit more friends with sheep than everybody else. Insert a New Zealander reference here somewhere. There's this moment, right, where God visits the outcasts. Why? Because he's trying to proclaim a kingdom of joy that says this, my kingdom will be one for the outcast. My kingdom will be one for the sinner. My kingdom will be one for the broken, for the lost, the lonely, the last, and the least. And the truth of Christmas joy, if that is none of those words can describe you, then I don't think Christmas joy will delight you. If we don't find ourselves as outcasts at some stage in our life as sinners, as the last, the lonely, the lost, and the least, then the joy of Christmas of Jesus Christ himself cannot be ours because it is not good news for us, friends. Because what do they tell him the good news is? Unto you this day is born in the city of David. Two things, a savior and Christ the Lord. He says to a shepherd, there is a savior. There is one coming for those who need saving. See, to know the joy of Christmas, friends, the first thing we need to recognize is we all need saving. Our internal realities are broken. If you do not know Jesus, then I would hazard a guess to say that there is something that maybe is is hurting in you. There is a lack. You know what it means to strive for happiness and come up empty. That's your story. But the story of Christmas is this, is that God doesn't look at your helpless estate and walk away. He looks at our brokenness, at our rebellion, at the way that many of us, if not all of us, have rejected God. He humbles himself, steps down, becomes a baby. He grows to become a perfect man after living a perfect life and dies a perfect death. Why? That you might have salvation. That if you come to Jesus and you acknowledge him as your Savior, if you acknowledge him as your Lord, he washes you clean and gives you a brand new start, friends, today. That's the beginning of Christian joy. Do you know that you are like a shepherd and outcast in need of a savior saying, you have a place with me? That's the inward reality that brings joy. But then there's an external reality where the angels say, Christ the Lord. See, it's only a, a part of the gospel that says that Christ came to save us from our sins. The full gospel, he didn't just come to save us from our sins, but to inaugurate a new kingdom. A new kingdom, not built on violence, not built on war, but a kingdom built on love, a kingdom built on peace, on hope, and a kingdom built on joy. A kingdom that one day, friends, will come in its fullness, renew all things, restore all things, will judge the living and the dead, and we will get to be made new, not just our souls, but our bodies as well. What does the angels give to the shepherds? It tells them the good news of an internal reality, but also an external trajectory. This is the marker of Christian joy. Christian joy is marked by an internal reality that we can be grateful for and an external trajectory that we can anticipate. And why is this so beautiful? Because it means, friends, that when we have joy, unlike happiness, that our joy cannot be stolen by suffering. Our joy cannot be stolen by pain. Our joy cannot be stolen by a bad diagnosis because joy and grief for the Christian can coexist. Joy and sorrow can coexist because joy is not a moment. It's not a feeling. It's an eternal reality we experience in ourselves and that we know we are heading towards. Can I show you a picture of Christian joy? A picture of Christian joy would be this church. In Syria, this is an image of the Syrian church returning to worship at Christmas time after ISIS, who bombed their church and ransacked it, were driven out of their town. If you notice in the middle of their building, there seems to be this weird greenery where they built a Christmas tree out of the rubble. 
and put a star on top. Why? Because they were overwhelmed by their grief? No, because I think they were choosing their joy. That in the middle of their pain and their suffering, in the middle of probably having lost loved ones, they were living a story that's far more powerful than the violence and fear and pain and suffering of this world. They were choosing joy. This is what Christian joy looks like. Not a moment where everything feels good, but an inward reality and an external trajectory. Friends, I wonder if you know that joy today. I wonder if that joy is yours. Timothy Keller says it like this, whilst other worldviews lead us to sit in the midst of life's joys, foreseeing the coming sorrows, Christianity empowers its people to sit in the midst of the world's sorrows, tasting the coming joy. See, joy is a moment where we can express gratitude for what Christ has done and anticipation of what he will continue to do despite what is happening around us. But it's more than just gratitude and anticipation. Do you know this? It's a promise. In John chapter 16, verse 22, Christ says this, Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take your joy. Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and he says this command to them. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, is Paul being insensitive here? He's writing to a church that's under persecution. They've got hardship. They've got stuff going wrong. They've got sickness, just like we do. Why is Paul saying rejoice? He's saying, even in the midst of it all, we choose a different way. We choose the way of joy. Paul knew what that meant. Why? Because he was beaten. He was hurt. He was driven naked out of towns. He was bitten by snakes. He knew what sickness and pain and trial looked like. And still he says, I will rejoice because my internal reality and my external trajectory cannot be changed by the suffering that we're walking through right now. What a beautiful story. Henry Henri Nouwen says it like this. Joy is essential to the spiritual life. Whatever we may think or say about God, when we are not joyful, our thoughts and words cannot bear fruit. Jesus reveals to us God's love so that His joy may become ours, that our joy may be complete. Joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved and that nothing, sickness, failure, emotional distress, oppression, war, or even death cannot take that love away. Joy is not the same as happiness. We can be unhappy about many things, but joy can still be there because it comes from the knowledge of God's love for us. Joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. It is a choice based on the knowledge that we belong to God and have found in God our refuge and our safety and that nothing, not even death, can take God away from us. Amen. Do you know joy this season? Do you know that God has found you? If someone was to bomb our church, to harm our relatives, where would we be found on Christmas Day? My prayer, my prayer is that this church would be a place of rebellious joy. No matter what happens, we cling to an inward reality, an external trajectory that says, I have joy in Christ Jesus. And nothing can shift it. Maybe you're sitting here today going, Michael, I don't know, like I, I'm following Jesus, but that joy is not real for me at the moment. And that's because finally, I think we need to learn the practice of joy. I had to learn this. There was a moment last year where I was really struggling. And, um, and I was just, you know, I was highly functional, doing really well in, in terms of my job and family, loving the people that I need to love. But just Sarah and I would talk about the fact that I was just profoundly sad. In moments, just where it was her and I, we would just sit together, just get teary. She'd be like, you okay? I'm just, I'm just sad. I'm just sad all the time. And so she's like, I think you need to talk to someone about it. I'm like, no, I don't need to talk to someone. I'm a pastor. I just, I'm talk to Jesus. We're fine. And she, she pushed me on it. She said, I, I really think, so I spoke to my um, supervisor, who's a psychologist, and just um, started unpacking it. She said, Michael, I think you need to go see a doctor. I think there's something deeper going on here. And I'm like, nah, I'm fine. I don't need to see a doctor. I've got Jesus. We're fine. And this bravado wore thin. So I went to a doctor. And the doctor denied, diagnosed me and said, hey, I think, I think you have some forms of mild depression going on right now. And, um, and there's some deep chemical imbalances in your body we've got to sort out. You're not Okay. Now, that's pretty hard for a pastor to hear. I'm a pastor. I'm meant to be okay, but I wasn't. And so the doctor, you know, they did some medical intervention. They helped me out, and, um, and it was really great. They put me on some plans, and we walked together with Sarah, my psychologist, and, and just like praying it through, and my body started to level out a bit more. But I've got to be honest, um, the joy didn't return. I became a lot more functional, became less sad, but the joy didn't come back. And here I was as a pastor trying to struggle with this idea of what depression was. There's someone who already struggles deeply with anxiety going, God, where are you in the midst of this? And I remember that joy is not something that can be achieved through medicine. 
I love the medical profession. I wouldn't be here today without them. They're beautiful people. But joy is something that can only be received by God. Joy is a gift from God. It's a gift through the gospel. And something we've got to practice. Otherwise, we forget it. And that's why I had to learn over the last year the practice of both gratitude and anticipation. That I have to be grateful for my inward reality. Friends, in this time, in this season, can I be honest? I know when I'm losing my joy, when words of entitlement come out of my mouth. I deserve. I should get. My family better this Christmas do this. How dare they? Why don't I? These are words of entitlement. Don't they mark our culture? Let's be honest. Don't they mark our hearts? But I think entitlement is the antithesis of gratitude. And what I've had to learn is to actually pause. I walked around the church last night just praying for, for what God was going to do today. Just saying, God, I'm just so thankful I get to do this. I can't believe I get to lead this church. I can't believe I've got a, a great wife and family. I can't believe I've got oxygen in my lungs. Even now as people with, with COVID are finding that a, a gift. You know, I'm like, thank God, I'm thankful for that. And this sense of gratitude began to remind me. I have an inward reality. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for myself. Thank you for calling me home. Friends, what are you grateful for? If you have nothing else, friends, there's an opportunity to be grateful for the salvation of Jesus Christ. We can have joy this season. The last one was anticipation. Anticipation is that we have an external trajectory that's heading into a good place. And I believe, and the Bible tells me a story of hope. A story that says that one day, friends, as someone that struggled with anxiety and depression, one day there will be no more anxiety or depression in Jesus' name. That is not the will of God. That one day we will stand before God a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. There'll be no more cancer. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more pain. We will stand in a new heaven and a new earth with a new bodies and everything will be perfect and we will glory in the Lord. And I hold to that day. I anticipate it. Joni Erickson taught this beautiful woman who was quadriplegic. She couldn't move her limbs. One day she found herself in church and the pastor said, hey, since God calling us all to kneel right now, and the whole church knelt except for her and she burst into tears, unable to move. Pastor came up to Joni and said, I'm so sorry that I was insensitive to you. She said, these are not tears of grief, but tears of joy. Because I saw an image that one day we will stand in heaven together with my new body. And when the people say, kneel, I will kneel. I will stand. I have hope. I have joy. That's what godly anticipation looks like. One day there'll be no more cancer, friends. One day there'll be no more death, no more war. And we as Christians have a strong reason to have joy. And the world cannot steal it from us. That is the joy of the Lord. That is the joy that is on offer. Friends, where do you need to be grateful today? And where is God calling you to anticipate? What do we anticipate? We anticipate war, don't we? World War III is around the corner. Don't anticipate war. Don't anticipate the next crypto crash. Don't anticipate a rise in diesel. Let's anticipate the kingdom of God. C.S. Lewis says it like this. Be on the screen behind me. Good things, as well as bad, you know, are caught by a kind of infection. If you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to it, even into the thing that it has them. They are not a sort of prize which God could, if he chose, just hand out to anyone. They are a great foundation of energy and beauty, spurting at the very center of reality. If you are close to it, the spray will wet you. If you are not, you will remain dry. Jesus promises you joy. In John chapter 15, he says, If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this. If you abide in me, if you remain in my love, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We've got to stay close to Christ. He is the source of our joy, even in the midst of our pain. And here's what I believe. I believe that God is calling you life to a season of joy. Not a season where there's no pain or suffering in our world, but a season where we are marked by a fearless, rebellious joy that looks at suffering and says, you will not have the last word. If suffering is around, then all I know is my God's not finished yet. Do you have joy this season? May we be a people who practice it more than we pursue happiness. Let's pray together. Lord, as we finish today, I really recognize there are people in this room right now who do not know the joy of their salvation. They've never known the salvation joy to come from death to life, to leave the sense of being a sinner into now being a part of the family. 
There are people when I talked about the inner world that they know the inner world is not okay with you. But Lord, even in our rebellion, you, provide, you, you help us with a way home. You call us home into your family and you give us an opportunity to declare you Lord and Savior. 